the good scripture reading, and Brother Philip, and the fine prayer that was prayed. Again, it is a privilege to be here on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. It's good to see Sister Joe back with us today also. Thankful that she's able to be here. You know, friends, it seems that man does not want responsibility. But tonight we're going to talk about privilege and responsibility and trusting the Lord. We find here the words of Jesus, Take ye away the stone, found in John chapter 11 and verse number 39. And our lesson text is John 11, 38, 45 that we read together a while ago. People want freebies and they want ease. Man does not want responsibility. Man wants privileges, though, without responsibility. We know that one of our presidential candidates is playing on this. He's offering all these free things. Mr. Sanders, we know that's his platform, to offer free things, many free things. And a lot of people like this because they want something free without having to work for it, without having to earn it. But this attitude of wanting something for nothing, uh, privilege without responsibility, and many good things without working is reflected even in human doctrines such as the faith-only doctrine. Those who teach, well, you can be saved by faith alone, you can go to heaven just by believing. But the Word of God refutes that error. James 2, 17, even so faith that hath not works is dead being alone. Verse 24, ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. It is seen in the fact that many don't want to work. They want something free. Yes, yet God's word says that we are to work. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, Paul wrote to the Thessalonian brethren, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now, I know there are some people in society that are disabled and unable to work. We're not talking about those people. But we're talking about people that are healthy and able-bodied that just won't work. You know, sometimes we've even seen this uh, in the home among some mothers and wives. They don't want to take care of their family. We see this among some men. They won't support their wife and family. They won't work. They won't do like they should. But we're going to make some other applications to this tonight also. Some important principles. We do need God's help and we depend on Him for many things. This is what Paul told the people in Athens, Greece. For in Him that is in God, we live and move and have our being. Acts 17, 28. We need the Lord every day. And only a foolish individual would deny such a proposition or the statement of this fact that we need the Lord. We all need the Lord. We know that. We need Him very much. God does for us many things that we cannot do for ourselves. You remember up on the mountain in Genesis 22 when God was going to offer His son Isaac as an offering? But God stopped him from doing so. He was put to the test. And later in verse 14, this is what Abraham called that place. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. So friend, if you get to doubting things and you're trying to do right, you're doing your best, you're serving the Lord, and you begin to have doubts, just remember that expression, Jehovah Jireh. And of course, Jehovah and the Lord is referring to the same person, God. The Lord will provide. God will provide. Paul wrote to the faithful congregation at Philippi who had served him faithfully and who were serving him faithfully and who had been sacrificial in their giving. He said, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 I hope and pray tonight that this lesson, based on the Word of God, it's not my wisdom, it's not my ability, but this lesson, based on God's Word, will be an encouragement to you, as it has been to me, in studying this lesson. Encouraging us to trust the Lord, along with seeing our own responsibility. A man is to work for a living. 
You know, Paul said that if a man provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel that is an unbeliever. 1 Timothy 5 and verse number 8. Although God does many things for us that we cannot do for ourselves, He has created us to be able to do certain things ourselves. He has given us responsibilities. We go back to the first man that God created, Adam. He gave him responsibility. In Genesis 2 and verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Oh, that's because man sinned, wasn't it? Work is a curse. Is that right? No, that's not right. Work is a blessing. Work makes people happy and joyful. This was before sin came to the world. This was before the curse. God gave Adam a job to do. Now, obviously tonight, the gist of this lesson is not just talking about working and making a living. It's talking about, as Christians, our responsibility, which, of course, includes to provide for our own. But it is a spiritual principle. When we're working for the Lord and we're serving Him, we're going to be a joyful and a happy people. Now, let's go back. Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. You might be wondering, where am I going with this? I thought we were going to talk about Jesus saying, take you away the stone in John 11, 39. Now let's go to Jesus performing a miracle and raising Lazarus from the dead. You remember that Jesus said to Lazarus, and his brother Ralph read a while ago, Lazarus, come forth. And we read in verse 44 that Lazarus came forth. That was the power of the word of Christ. He had the power to raise the dead as proof of his deity. The purpose of the Lord's miracles is stated later in the book of John, in the 20th chapter, John chapter 20. There's something else to bear in mind in the New Testament that signs and miracles designate the same thing. Signs, wonders, miracles, and the miraculous gifts of the Holy Ghost. This is referring to supernatural acts that only God could do. And of course, God did them through the apostles. But the apostles didn't have the power to do those things themselves. But they were enabled to do that by God. And the purpose of their doing them was to confirm the word of God, Mark 16, 19, 20, Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. But Jesus, during his earthly ministry, did many miracles. He performed many signs. In John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, we read in many other signs, did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now there were many miracles recorded in the New Testament. But we know that John says concerning this book that he wrote that there were many others that he did that were not recorded here in John. But yet the ones that were recorded were sufficient to prove that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah, the Christ that he would be the Christ who would come into the world to save man. He would be the deliverer. And they would prove that he is the Son of God, that he actually is divine. Now, when we look here at the book of John in the 11th chapter, we note that Jesus revealed here that this would be done, that he was going to do to glorify God. Earlier, four days earlier, before or right when Lazarus had died, we remember that Jesus waited. He didn't go directly to Bethany to raise Lazarus. This gave time for the body of Lazarus to decompose. So when the Lord came to raise him from the dead, everybody would know for sure that this really is a miracle. The Lazarus hasn't just gone into a stupor or fallen asleep or gone into a coma. He was really dead. In fact, you remember verse uh, number 39 here that Martha said he had been four, dead four days. He, yet st he stinketh. His body had begun to decompose. But earlier, Jesus said to his disciples, this, of course, when Jesus learned that he was sick, uh, he wasn't 
dead yet according to this report, but certainly he did die. Uh, in verse number 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Whenever Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was glorified, the Father was glorified also. And so these miracles proved the deity of the Lord and His Messiahship. They also were for the glory of God in proving that. We know later here in the chapter, in John chapter 11, I'm going to read 39 and 40 again. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? This is amazing, isn't it? It was for the glory of God to affirm who the Lord really was. It was to glorify God as we've seen. Now let's look at verse 39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Now Albert Barnes says here concerning the fact that Lazarus had been dead four days before Jesus raised him and that his body had begun to decompose. He says this, This proves that there could be no deception for it could not have been a case of suspended animation. All these circumstances are mentioned to show that there was no imposture. Imposters do not mention minute circumstances like these. They deal in generals only. Every part of this narrative bears the marks of truth. And you know Barnes is exactly right about that. This narrative shows that Jesus actually did raise a man from the dead who had been dead for four days. Amazing. But why did Jesus command them to remove the stone from the tomb? Why? This was something they were able to do. And also it gave further verification because in going to the tomb, no doubt they could smell that odor. Or they could tell that this man was really dead when they removed that stone. Very possibly could have smelled that odor. Brother Guy in Woods makes this comment. Deity never does for man what man can do for himself. Now those people there had the ability to remove that stone from the tomb. They had that ability. So the Lord tells them to remove the stone from the tomb's mouth. Jesus was about to do something that human power could not perform. The raising of the dead, as we just read a while ago. We know that one day the voice of Christ will call forth the dead to the judgment. In John 5, verse 28 and 29, Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's the power of the voice of our Lord. This would no doubt be a miracle that is the raising of Lazarus. A supernatural act that only God can do. That's what a miracle was. It superseded natural law. Yet the Lord continues to do things for us providentially within the framework of natural law today that we're unable to do. And I hope and pray tonight that this lesson is going to reinforce our confidence in God's activity in the universe and especially in behalf of His people that He works providentially in our behalf, that He is working for us. He doesn't have to do a miracle to do great things. Let us put our confidence in the Lord. There are many Bible examples. I'm not going to go into detail on all of these. But here are examples where God worked to do things for man that He could not do, but yet man also had attendant responsibilities. Noah in the building of the ark, Genesis 6, verses 8 to 22. Jesus feeding the multitude, John 6, verses 1 to 15. Elijah on Mount Carmel, you know, Elijah had to have that altar erected. And you know, he worked all day, but yeah, when he came right down to it, there, was, there were things he couldn't do. God sent fire down on that altar. God had to do that. 
He licked up all the water in the trenches. That was God's power, but yet Elijah had a work to do there that day also as a prophet and proving that the true and living God is the God of Israel, the Lord God Jehovah. There in 1 Kings chapter 18. Getting in his army of 300 men who defeated the multitudes there of the Midianites and others in Judges chapter 7. They had a certain strategy that they followed. They were separated into three companies of 100 each. You remember burying the pitcher with a lamp light in it and breaking the pitchers and uh, all the other things that they did that day. But of course, it was God's power that delivered their enemies into their hand. It wasn't simply what they did. They cooperated in doing God's work. But it's a great lesson there. That God did for them what they couldn't do, but they had a part to play. They had a responsibility. In each case, whether it involved a miracle or not, man had certain responsibilities. And God did that which man was not able to do. Now let's look at Noah and the ark. I want to look at this one example more closely. We remember in Genesis chapter 6 that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, verse number 8. And we see why, according to verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Look at this great example here. Although he found grace, he still had to obey God. You know, there are people today that think if you have the grace of God, you don't have to do anything. Noah still had to obey God, though he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Some people think, well, if you're saved by grace through faith, and we are, for by grace are you saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, but it's not faith only. It's obedient faith. They think, well, if you're saved by grace, you just sit down, you just enjoy your grace only and your faith only doctrine, and you don't really have to obey the Lord. You don't have to do all these many things that uh, these legalists are teaching, as they would call people who believe in following the Bible strictly. That's a false doctrine, this grace only and faith only idea. God did for Noah that which he would never have been able to do without God's help. Now, this is crucial right here to understand the principle. Here in Genesis 6, 13 to, 4, to 16, it's crucial that we see this. God revealed to Noah what he was going to do. By divine revelation, Noah learned what the Lord God was going to do, which he could not have known otherwise without divine revelation. Verse number 13, Genesis chapter 6. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, could Noah have known that God was going to do that had the Lord not revealed it to him? Absolutely not. That's one thing that the Lord did for Noah right there. But well, let's look further. It was revealed to Noah the perfect dimensions for a cargo-carrying vessel which the ark was going to be. Now, you know, even in uh, recent, uh, I believe it was in the 1800s, that the dimensions were discovered, the perfect dimensions for a cargo carrying vessel, and they were the exact ratio given by God to Noah in Genesis chapter 6. Now how would Noah have known that without God? Well, he would not have known it. We remember in Genesis chapter 6, these instructions. God told him, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it off. The length of the earth, the ark, shall be 300 cubits, that's about 450 feet, a football field and a half. And the breadth of it, 50 cubits, that's about 75 feet. And the height of it, 30 cubits, that's 45 feet. That's a, about a four-story building in height. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. It was made of three stories, but these stories were higher than a typical building today. Just think of all the wildlife that had to exist on that ark and all the food they would have to have for the various animals and creatures. But there's something else that God revealed to him. He also revealed to Noah the proper materials with which to build the ark. Verse 14, 
Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without the pitch. He told him the kind of wood to use, and that he was to pitch it. That, of course, would seal up the ark. So God gave him these divine instructions, and we know that Noah obeyed them all. A good example for us today. God did for Noah that which Noah could not have done without God's help. Yet nothing in the sacred text indicates that a miracle was performed in the building of the ark. <clears throat> that is, the building of the ark itself. Have you ever thought about that? That in the building of the ark, Noah, a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2, verse 5, build this ark. He had God's help providentially, but there's nothing taught in the text that taught that anything miraculous was done. They had to gather the wood. They had to do the work on the ark. They put forth the labor with God's help. Now, there were things that God did. By divine revelation, He revealed things to Noah. But as far as the actual construction of the ark itself, there's nothing there that indicates that it was miraculous, although God did help Noah. If Noah had not obeyed God, then he would not have been saved from destruction. Thankfully, he did obey God. Look at Genesis 6, verse 22. The chapter ends with these words, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Does that remind you of any verse in the New Testament? What did Jesus say in Matthew 28, 20? And by the way, how many times have you heard people say, oh, we can't do everything the Lord requires? Have you ever heard people argue that? We hear that from denominations, sometimes from even from some of our brethren. But the Bible says Noah did it. He didn't do it miraculously. He did it because he had faith in God. Look at the next verse, chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. What does it mean to be righteous? Well, the Apostle John agrees with what Moses recorded here in the book of Genesis. Moses who wrote the first five books of the Bible. The Apostle John said, He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous, that is the Lord. Did Noah do righteousness? Yes. He did the commandments of the Lord. According to Psalm 119, verse 172, all thy commandments are righteousness. And so Noah was righteous because he did righteousness. He did right. He obeyed the commandments of the Lord, which are righteousness. But then look in chapter 7, verse 5 of Genesis. And Noah did according to all, <clears throat> excuse me, according unto pages on third. All that the Lord commanded him. All that the Lord commanded him. He did it all. He obeyed what the Lord told him to do. Noah was a great man. He obeyed God. You know that's what makes you a great person? You know that to be highly educated or wealthy or well known or anything like that. All you have to do is obey God. That's true greatness. That's what a servant is. Jesus said, He that's greatest among you should be your servant. Matthew 23, 11. Friends, if we do that in life, we may not achieve any worldly honors or awards, but if we obey God in this life, that is a successful life. That is the most successful life. I guarantee you a lot of these supposedly worldly successful people don't do is obey God. But you can obey God, you and me. Whether we're rich or poor, no matter who we are, how lowly in life, no matter where we came from, we can all obey God. In so doing, in obeying God, Noah saved himself and his family. Look at Hebrews 11, 7. This is a great statement. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. We read again of Noah and his wife and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth and their wives in 1 Peter 3, 20. It doesn't call them by name there, but it says that eight souls were saved by water, referring to Noah. That's Noah and his family that it's referring to. 
But now let's look at another example. Jesus taught us to pray, give us, this, give us this day our daily bread. We're so familiar with that, aren't we? Matthew 6, 11. That's part of the Lord's model prayer that he gave to us. Give us this day our daily bread. I'm sure a lot of children can say that. That's something that we know throughout the land. I'm sorry, though, a lot of people in this country don't know many scriptures like people used to. But that's a well-known statement, isn't it? from the Lord's model prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Well, think about that and what it means. Yet Jesus expects us to work for our daily bread. We've already seen what Paul said by inspiration of God in 2 Thessalonians 3, that if a man would not work, neither should he eat. If that be the case, we're going to have a lot of hungry people out here because a lot of people don't want to work. As my mother used to say, they want him to lick and write a snake. I don't know if you've heard that before. But that's the truth about a lot of people. Paul in Ephesians 4, verse number 20, gives working as a remedy to stealing. He said, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands a thing which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. When we work, we labor, we not only do that for our family, but we have to give to those in need. And of course, certainly to give to the work of the Lord, as we are to give. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. Jesus miraculously fed the multitudes in John 6, verses 5 to 13. We remember that. There were 5,000 men that were fed. They were in desperate need for food, according to Matthew's account. Matthew 14, 15 to 17. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give you them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. You remember that great story? You know, there was no occasion where the Lord fed 4,000 men. But we know that God's providential help is needed. Man is to provide for his family. We've already seen that, 1 Timothy 5, 8. Yet God provides for us <coughs> by way of his providence. God is not going to set on a miraculous feast today because that which is perfect has come, God's complete revelation of man with the completion of the New Testament. And Paul predicted that the miraculous gifts would cease when that happened, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. So we're not going to have a miracle done on earth today like they had then. But even in the case of feeding the multitudes, Jesus required effort on the part of those present. Just look at that. He used the five loaves and the two fishes and ordered them to sit in a certain way, according to Matthew, uh, Mark 6, 39 and 40. Of course, we can also read of this account, Matthew 14 and John chapter 6. God's providential work is just as great as was his miraculous work. But only God can put the life into the seed and produce the growth. As we see that he did in the plant kingdom that he ordered there in Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. I'm going to go back for just a moment to John chapter 6, this miracle of feeding the multitudes. Uh... Verse 8, beginning, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Yeah, there's a great lesson right there. The Lord took those five barley loaves and two small fishes and fed thousands of people. A lot of times, Again, and I'm not saying that we're going to do a miracle or the Lord's going to do a miracle, but we say, oh, well, we just got so little, so little talent, so little means, we can't do this, we can't do that. Give it to the Lord and let Him do it. But we have to do our part. We have to cooperate. We have a responsibility to work and to do and to make good. And the Lord will do the rest. He will take care of what we can't do. We have to understand that philosophy as Christians. It's important, very important. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. 
And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to the disciples, and the disciples of them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, they'd gotten full, they'd eaten to the full. He said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. They even had food left over. Isn't that amazing? That's the Lord's mighty hand at work. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Now, today, as we say, the Lord's not going to set on a miraculous feast. But he does a lot of great things through his providential hand. We're not to ever think that the Lord's providential work is inferior to his miraculous work. He does many things for us every day, providentially working in the framework of natural law. Now we can prove that. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Now where do you get seeds for an apple tree? From an apple tree. From the apples that the tree produces. Isn't that amazing? Somebody said that only God can count the trees in one seed. Isn't that amazing? And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, only God could put the life, the germ of life, into one seed. Only God could do that. We can't do that. God did it. We can see how it produces, but only God could do that. But yet man has to put that seed into the ground, doesn't he? Man has to till the ground, cultivate the soil, reap the harvest, get it to the mill, etc. We couldn't do this without God. But we can't just sit there and say, oh, well, that sure is good-looking seed. It would make some nice fruit, nice crop. You know, you might have heard about the man that moved to town from the country, and he left two bags of wheat seeds with his neighbor. He left one bag of precious wheat seed with one neighbor, and he left another bag with another neighbor. He came back a year or so later, and he passed by the field of one man, and it was all grown up with weeds. There was no crop. And he went by the field of another neighbor, the other neighbor, to whom he gave seed, and it was a field of gleaming golden green. What was the difference? Well, he asked the other one, he said, what would you do with that weed seed I gave you? He said, I put it in the attic, and the rats ate it. You know, that weed seed was precious, wasn't it? But it had to be planted. It had to be cultivated. God does that which we can't do, but we have a responsibility. Now, here are some principles involved. Only God can raise the dead like he did Lazarus in John 11, 43 and 44. God raised Jesus from the dead according to Acts 13, 30. But there at the tomb of Lazarus, man had something to do. And that was to take the stone away, and they did according to verse 41. Only Christ can remove sin. <coughs> Only Jesus Christ, Him that loved us and washed from our sins in His own blood, Revelation 1 5. Ephesians 1 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Yet man must comply with God's will to be saved by Christ and His blood. As wonderful as the death of Christ was that Brother Ralph talked about this morning, if we don't obey the gospel, it will do us absolutely no good. We have to comply with God's plan of salvation. To hear and believe the Word of God, Acts 18, 8. To believe and repent, Acts 2, 38. Confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. And then arise and be baptized and wash away our sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. And then keep on loving Jesus and obeying His commandments, John 14, 15. But we're not finished yet. Only Christ can save the lost. Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We read how that God committed His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, 
We shall be saved from wrath for him, Romans 5, 8 and 9. Yet, man must go forth to bring men to Christ, like the early church did. You remember that the Lord appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. But the Lord wouldn't tell him what to do to be saved. He sent him into Damascus. And there Ananias told him what to do to be saved. We know that Cornelius was instructed to send for Peter by God in Acts 10. God could have told Cornelius, get my tongue tangled here, could have told Cornelius what to do, but that was not God's plan. After the church began, it was God's plan for the church to tell people what to do to be saved. And thus in Acts 8, 4, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the Samaria and preached unto them the Christ. Verse 5. Jesus said, Here's something, we're not to slay. John 4, 35. Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. Don't make excuses. There's all kinds of opportunity out here to teach people that are lost. The fields are wide in the hearts. Only God could originate the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God through salvation to everyone that believed, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Romans 1, 16, man didn't come up with the gospel, God did. Yet man must go forth and teach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. There according to Mark 16, Matthew 28. Do we trust God to help? Now this is the last of all this evening. I hope this part will be very encouraging to us as we close our lesson. Regardless of how great our efforts are, we must have God's help. Jesus said, for without me you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Turn back there to Psalm 60, verse 11 and 12. Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do vainly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. It's God. We are laborers together with him, according to 1 Corinthians 3, 9, Paul said. And they're also taught in 2 Corinthians 6, 1. God is able not only to do greater than anything we can or men can do, but He is able to do greater than anything we can even imagine, we can ask or think. Now, do you remember that? Do you and I remember that when we pray? That He's not only able to do things that we cannot do or that we cannot conceive, but he's able to do it beyond our wildest imagination. When we put faith in prayer, we should trust that fact. God can do greater than anything we can imagine. The Bible teaches that. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church, verse 21. By Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. I mean, I'm afraid sometimes we want to humanize God in the way we think. I know we don't think that He's human, but we want to visualize that He can only do what we can do, or, or He can only work it out the way that we see we, it can be worked out, our problems. But no, God's greater than that. God's wisdom is greater than ours. James teaches us pray for wisdom, but to ask in faith nutty, nothing doubting, for he that wavereth or doubteth. Uh, James warns against being that way. That we're not to ask in doubt and wavering in James chapter 1. Do we trust God for his help? Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. You know, the wise man knew exactly the way people are. We want to trust in our heart. We want to lean on our understanding. We're not to do that. We're to trust in the Lord. He is all wise, all powerful, all knowing. We are to trust in Him, not our own strength. Do we pray in faith? Do we pray trusting in the Lord? 
Again, go over to Psalm 116, 1. David said, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. That's a great reason to love the Lord. Psalm 62, verse 8, we're taught to pour out our heart before the Lord. Psalm 62, 8, trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not worry. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Didn't we sing about that this morning? I believe we did. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, made known unto God. And then what will happen? And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then 1 Peter 5, 7, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. As we close, <clears throat> let us work and put God first. Like Jesus, He said, I must work the vent works of Him that sent me. Why did this day the night come? No man can work. John 9 4. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abiding in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 58. Let us not abuse prayer. Now, what do I mean by that? There are people that are not working for the Lord, they're not faithful. But they pray and they expect God to give them everything. All they can just do is ask the Lord. They don't have to do anything. That's a false doctrine. James said, The fetch of fervent prayer of a righteous man. Remember what a righteous man is according to Noah's example? He is one who does righteousness, who does God's will. The fetch of fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5, verse 16. Which will we choose? As one faithful brother said several years ago, if you have a work for the Lord to do and something that you want to do, always put the Lord's work first. Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. As we close several years ago, there was a story an article in the Gospel Advocate about the late Brother W.A. Bradfield. He was a very effective gospel preacher. He had the opportunity to go on a fishing trip on the Chesapeake Bay in 1944. And it's not, we're not saying there's anything wrong with going fishing or some recreation, but this is a good story. He had the opportunity to go on a fishing trip on the Chesapeake Bay back in 1944. But he didn't go. He remained home, and he wrote his famous track, The Way to Heaven. And nearly 2,500,000 copies of that track have been printed and distributed. And according to Brother Guy Woods, influence in the lives of multitudes and bring them to knowledge of the truth, thus resulting in inestimable good. You watch it, friends. You always put the Lord first and see if great things don't start happening. But it's a choice and a decision we have to make every day. And if we'll put the Lord first and do His will, we will be amazed at what the Lord can and will do through us and for us and for the church of our Lord. This evening, and the lesson is yours, if any need to come and to put on Christ and baptism, Galatians 3.27, or to come back to the Lord in a penitent heart and confession, Acts 8, 20 and 24. We invite you to come while we stand and we sing together.
Amen. Uh-huh.